good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Adam Jagleski, and I'm from Mars Discovery District in Toronto, Ontario. I want to first thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to come and, and take in this lecture. And I'm, I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing a relatively new topic, uh, impact investing, and uh, hopefully sharing some examples and some strategies and different tools that makes impact investing a new, a new way of thinking. Um, impact investing, for those that uh, have yet to hear what this is all about, um, it's a new way of thinking, a new way of investing capital that generates a social impact as well as an environmental return um, and also a financial return at the same time. So this is not about granting, this is not about new, new ways of, of uh, government money uh, being used for social causes. This is a new way of thinking um, and delivering social impact. Um, Mars Discovery District is an innovation center in Toronto. This is our beautiful building. It's an old uh, hospital. It's actually where insulin was first discovered. We've renovated and retrofitted the building and it's supposed to be a welcoming environment for entrepreneurs. So we provide advisory services, market intelligence, um, education services, and in some cases finance for uh, entrepreneurs in Ontario. And uh, in 2011, we were, um, we, we, decided that uh, in, as a complement to our existing practices in, in um, clean technologies, energy, information communication and technologies, we decided that social innovation was an important aspect of the innovation landscape in Canada. And we're successful in, in uh, starting our Centre for Impact Investing, which seeks to mobilize private capital for public benefit. I first want to start this presentation by framing it within this social innovation context. So we're going to be discussing uh, how capital moves into the social sector, but I think it's important to understand that social innovation, uh, broadly speaking, is, is one of the reasons why we're looking at new capital. So social innovation is defined as any initiative that challenges over time and contributes to changing and defining routines resources, and authority flows or beliefs of the broader social system in which it's introduced. Successful social innovation have durability, scale, and transformative impact. Social innovation can be seen as a process. So I think it's important to point out that when you have a social issue, uh, you first need to define the problem, organize people and the, the ideas around how that problem problem can be transformed and then think about how how we can institutionalize and create new partnerships around the social issue and ultimately looking at how to scale and how to serve more people and achieve greater impact ultimately if you can achieve greater impact we can change the system in which the social issue is working within social investment comes in because capital is required to achieve that scale, that durability, and that transformative impact. And so at the, at the, at the point in time where a social innovation has, has determined to be viable, the capital that's required is significantly changes the way people, people, people view um, how, how to capitalize that. And so we need an opportunity to bring in new capital, and we're going we're gonna to share some examples on how to do that. Social finance refers to investments in social enterprise or financial vehicles that are intended to generate a positive return as well as a social impact. I think the key differentiator here is the intentionality of the investment and the intentionality of, of who's using that capital. So the investor intention, investors allocate capital to investments where they expect both financial return as well as positive social impact. Investees' intentions, they have business models that are generating social impact and, and positive financial returns. So there's a sustainable business model there. The key point to all of this is that the social impact is measurable and that we're able to see change over time. So what's driving the need for social innovation and social finance? A couple different things. 
So we have a general shift to preventative and preventative interventions. So people would, would like to get to the root cause of some of these social issues, whether it's chronic disease, homelessness, early childhood development. People would like to understand how to get to the, the root cause of some of the social problems. Would like to experiment and pilot with new ways of testing the innovations and want to use an evidence base of information in order to make decisions. There's an increase, increasing number of wicked problems, rising in intensity of those problems, and the complexity of it. As I mentioned, homelessness, diabetes in our country, um, the number of children in foster care, all wicked problems that we're trying to find new solutions to. And there's rising expectations. People are not okay with the status quo anymore. People are requiring these changes and there's increasingly lower resources, whether it be personal donations or, or, or grant money or government money to fund these social, social issues. So some of the overarching trends in, in the social finance marketplace, we have entrenched social and environmental problems pers from persistent poverty to climate change. We have go government austerity measures and revenues are constrained we have growing number of impact ventures though on the positive side. We have entrepreneurs that are thinking about new business models that embedded in that business model is a, a way to generate social impact and improve the lives of individuals and communities. Also on the positive, we have institutional investors that are rethinking their, the way that they're making investments. They would like to see double or triple bottom line opportunities and want to know that the impact that they're achieving is a result of their investments. And it, this is, but this, I want to embed this in, into the context that this is an, this is an emerging marketplace. And, and this marketplace requires a number of different actors and willing uh, players to partner together. There's many examples of social finance and there's a few tools that I'd like to share with you guys to make this real. Some of the debt products that are out there help capitalize new, uh, new buildings that either house nonprofit organizations or something like a, a, a fund that capitalizes uh, supportive housing or affordable housing for individuals. Typically takes the form of a debt instrument. There's a couple different examples. Um, one, one, one more notable example that's come about in the last couple of years is the notion of a community bond where a, a coupon is issued to an investor for, that, for their capital over time and that capital is used to build a building. That building, uh, in the case of some of the, the, the community bonds in, the, in Toronto, is used to house some of the nonprofit organizations that are serving uh, populations in Toronto. An equity investment um, is, is, a, is an instrument used to fund typically startup uh, entrepreneurs or startup ventures. And we have examples. Investico is, a, is an environmental based uh, fund. Renewal um, is, a, is another early stage uh, fund that, that funds um, organizations in Canada and in the US that are in the small to medium, medium range of companies. Outcome finance. Another tool that's been used, I will get into a little bit more detail on what this is, but essentially this is, this is a way for government to enter into agreements on which they agree to pay for the success of an outcome and raise capital on the basis of that contract. And catalytic capital is a way in which governments are, are uh, typically governments are uh, gu guaranteeing some of these loans to make them less risky to investors. So as an example, the YWCA in uh, Toronto, uh, it's called the Elm Centre Project, it, it houses uh, uh, at-risk women, Aboriginal women um, and uh, women that are fleeing abuse in, in Toronto. It's a 300 unit affordable housing, housing unit. Um, and the unique nature of this example is that it brought together funding from the, the province, it brought together funding from the city. It's a traditional loan from Infrastructure Ontario, which, which provides infrastructure capital in, in the province. But a million dollars was carved off 
for investors, for, um, for impact investors that wanted to contribute to the development of this building. In this case, $1 million was, um, was released to uh, a private foundation that agreed to fund um, the build out of this, uh, of this building. What it was able to do is reduce the, uh, the debt overhead that the YMCA, the YWCA, sorry, um, was, was taking on. Next. A community employment loan. So Social Capital Partners is a unique example of an organization that very simply loans capital that that capital or the interest rate tied to that capital is a function of the amount of social hiring the organization does. So uh, if the organization agrees to, uh, to hire 10 social hires, then the, the, the rate of return for the uh, the rate of return for the investor is capped at X percent. If it goes up to 15 social hires, the, the, the debt, um, uh, the, sorry, the interest rate for the debt decreases. So it's, a, it's, it's tied lockstep to, to the interest rate. The Alberta Social, uh, Endow Social Innovation Endowment Fund. This is, this is the whole notion that Alberta was going to use some of their resource money, some of their heritage money for an endowment for social innovation. And so they agreed to capitalize an endowment, initially $500 million um, in 2015 to, to fund some research um, in some of the, the schools, to fund innovative new products like social impact bonds, which I'll introduce in a second, um, capitalize social investment funds, and create a marketplace for social finance in the province. The three pillars, research and knowledge, uh, funding models and partnerships, and prototyping, design, and implementation. And so the last one is th this, this idea that there's, a, there's an innovation space where people can design new solutions to, to, to some of the problems faced in Alberta and, and then see to, that, see to their prototyping and see to their scaling. Another example is we're, that uh, we're closely following here in Canada is the notion that uh, the U United Kingdom is using um, some of the, the, the monies um, generated from dormant bank accounts and using that money for social purposes. So they, in, um, in 2012, I believe, capitalized what they're calling a big society, big society capital. And so they're using 200, um, 200 million pounds worth of um, dormant bank account money. And then they're using 400 million pounds of uh, institutional investor capital. And they're creating a wholesale fund. This wholesale fund then distributes um, this capital to intermediaries that are supporting the, the space in, in the United Kingdom. The last example that I'd like to share is, is, is what we're calling a social impact bond. This is a relatively new tool that's being used to fund uh, the development of social, uh, development and scaling of social services. An example, the only example in Canada is the Saskatchewan Sweet Dreams project. And this is a, this is a partnership agreement between the Saskatchewan government and a nonprofit organization that deals with uh, at-risk single mothers and their children. The whole notion behind the partnership is that um, if funded, they will keep children, if fun funded in a safe and stable housing, uh, the children will stay with their families and there'll be wraparound supports for their mothers. And the notion is that the in, the, the, in this case, the investor, which is a credit union, as well as a family, the Ma family in Saskatchewan, have provided $1 million to the nonprofit organization. And there's a contract between the nonprofit organization and the government in which government agrees to pay if there are, these families stay together. The government has done a cost benefit analysis on how much money they will save if those families stay together, rather than treating the very costly remedial treatment downstream and have agreed to pay back for, if, if, the, if the project is a success, have agreed to pay back the investors, their principal as well as a rate of return. Just to dive a little bit deeper on this social impact bond model, um, this is the, the straw man framework on how this works. 
So you have a government commissioner that agrees to pay an organization that is delivering services or an intermediary if the nonprofit organization doesn't have the capacity to run the program themselves. That intermediary organization then raises investment capital from an investor and they're able to have long-term sustainable funding over several years to deliver that intervention to the target population. If the social metrics and the targets are met, then the investors will get their money paid back. If the targets aren't met, then the government does not pay the investors back. So this is very much a pay for success model. In, the, in a social impact bond, a lot of questions come up around how do, how do you measure success? How do you track performance? How do you determine the causation of the actual intervention to what is being done and being achieved? An evaluator has a role in determining some of that, and that evaluator usually is a third party. Some of the different um, issue areas or social policy areas in which the social impact bond is being contemplated here in Canada as well as globally. Area of recidivism, so reducing the amount of people that are reoffending or going into the jail system every year. At-risk children or children in care. A lot of early childhood development programs are being considered using this model. Um, the whole notion of, of training, uh, job readiness and, em and employment programs. Aging in home, homelessness, early childhood and preschool development. The whole notion of getting ahead of uh, a social issue and tackling the root cause is, is one of the fundamental criteria for developing a social impact bond. Areas of preventative health care also, um, right now our, our Mars is working on a project in the area of hypertension and diabetes. Um, significant opportunity, at least in Canada, we believe to be tackling preventative health. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Doyle, who will talk a little bit about some of the policy movements and share some lessons learned that we've been working with. So uh, switching gears a little bit, a lot of the examples and the models that Adam just described are emerging in a fairly nascent marketplace. And in order to see those models become uh, used in a more widespread fashion and applied to a variety of local contexts across the country, we're going to need to see some changes and some uh, action on the part of governments, on the part of foundations, institutional investors, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits. Now, in 2010, the Canadian Task Force on Social Finance was convened to look at specific recommendations. Um, for expanding Canada's impact investment marketplace, and it was addressed to, to all of these actors. They came up with seven different recommendations uh, focused on um, mobilizing new sources of capital, on creating a more enabling regulatory and legislative framework, and on sort of priming the pipeline of investment-ready social enterprises and, and projects. Uh, so some of those recommendations, I won't go into all the details, but some included a call to action for foundations to invest 10% of their endowments uh, in impact investments by 2020, which is significant considering that foundation endowments in Canada total about 42 billion at the moment. Uh, it called on the federal government to work with investors and regional funds to create uh, a national impact investment fund of funds, somewhat similar to what the federal government is doing in the area of venture capital. I don't know if you can hear me here. I'll try to. Um, and it, it also asked governments to, to look at ways in which they could step back and kind of cut red tape, get out of the way by creating a more enabling uh, framework in particular for, uh, for non-profits to adopt more revenue generation type models and be able to attract investment capital. Um, do you want to flip? So then at the global level, much more recently, the Social Impact Investment Task Force was launched by Prime Minister David Cameron a year ago at a G8 meeting. And uh, that process was designed to, to look, to sort of scan, uh, it was the G7 plus Australia, Russia was no longer in the process at that point, uh, to scan the best practices, um, the challenges, the opportunities that existed across those countries, uh, to draw on expert uh, groups within those countries on issue-specific working groups, looking at things like measurement, applicability to international development, those, those types of things. 
uh, and to come up with recommendations, again, addressed to this, this wide array of different actors for expanding a global impact investment market. And that report came out last Monday, and the sort of the headline of that report was this, uh, this projection that the global impact investment market could reach the size of $1 trillion if the recommendations put forward in that report um, were adopted. And this is, this is a task force that was chaired by, or is chaired by, Sir Ronald Cohen, who is known as the, the godfather of venture capitalism, I think, in, in uh, the UK. And he, he certainly sees this market as potentially following a similar trajectory to that of, of venture capital, uh, something that was initially seen as very risky, it was happening only in small instances here and there, and gradually kind of gathered steam and became an accepted practice that was uh, funneling capital towards innovation in the, the traditional business sector, this would be fueling innovation in the social sector. Um, so uh, actually, I'll just dwell on that for one moment longer. So the report that was just referenced, this was Canada's report or Canada's contribution to the broader process. So each country released its own report that was more domestically focused. And we built off of the 2010 Canadian Task Force recommendations, but focused in on two particular areas in much greater depth. So it's not the most fascinating read, but it, it does put forward some very detailed, specific policy recommendations. The first half targets the Income Tax Act, uh, in addition to provincial trust law, which, um, which tends to maintain this binary understanding of for-profit and non-profit activity. So charities, non-profits are meant to, uh, to, to serve populations in need. They kind of conceive of them as soup kitchens and don't really see beyond that, I think. And then for-profit is meant to maximize profit. And we're, we're increasingly operating in this space where those two things are com coming together in really interesting and innovative ways. And there's, there's more of an impetus to get that right, I think, following the 2008 financial crisis, because we're now expecting nonprofits to do more with less. They've seen declines in donations, which are only starting to creep back up again. And government grants became a bit uneven in the wake of, of the financial crisis. And yet we're telling them increasingly that, that, no, they can't be engaging in revenue generating activity or they can only do it in very constrained ways. So we, we looked in detail at, uh, at how to make that easier for them, how to make that process make more sense and how to allow foundations to use their endowments for impact to merge their philanthropic and investment arms. Um, for, for greater impact. And the second half then looked at options for governments to bring new capital into the market uh, through capital matching programs and incentives, uh, through tax credits, through first loss capital guarantees, that type of thing. And also to look at creating an outcomes payment fund, which would help to do what Adam was talking about with social impact bonds at scale by setting uh, outcomes targets, pricing them, and then asking the market to respond with innovative solutions. So that's what's in the report. If you want to look at it in more detail, it is online. Uh, it was released last week. We'll flip to the next slide. So one of the fundamental questions that I think drives this whole conversation about trying to expand the, the growth of this market is are we having an impact? And it's a question, I, I come from a government background myself, I think it's a question that we've often scratched our heads about. We, we put money out there, we fund these programs, but we look at what happens on a more short-term basis. We're not always collecting the right data to figure out if ultimately it's doing what we want it to be doing. We're, we're counting you know, how many people come through the door and not whether in five years' time um, graduation rates have increased or, or whatever metric it is we ultimately want to be addressing. So something that is interesting, it's not unique to impact investment, but something that impact investment does is focus on measuring impact. And I think that's a really critical aspect of, uh, of this tool. The other critical aspect of it is that we have a lot of capital that's locked up in private markets that currently is not being used for, uh, for social impact. So impact investment is not about replacing government money, it's not about replacing philanthropic money, it's about tapping into some portion of uh, private capital markets and, and using that to fuel uh, broader social impact. It's about making government and phil philanthropic dollars go further and about using those dollars to attract additional um, private capital to grow the overall pot that's available to solve some of the really wicked problems we're, we're facing. So who are the players in this space? Government is clearly a key one. Uh, governments can create the environments in which others are able to act and innovate. Uh, investors clearly are, are necessary to make this whole thing happen. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, foundations or high net worth individuals who are philanthropically minded uh, moving into the space, using their investments in ways that formerly they only thought about as being a space for, for grant activity. But more traditional investors are also moving into this space. And, and we see a real potential for 
I think as the task force report says, for um, social impact to be added as a third dimension to the traditional capital market dimensions of risk and return uh, and to be applied across asset classes. This requires a culture change, which is where I think it's going to be really critical for investors to look at early wins and early successes um, that the, the leaders, the trailblazers, are, are seeing. Um, for philanthropists, there's, I think, a, a need for them to, to start ensuring that their, their philanthropic side and their investment side are talking, and that's, that's a really big barrier right now. They're just, they're completely separate processes. They don't, they don't tend to align. And I think there's a real opportunity both for foundations uh, and other philanthropic actors to use their grant dollars to help catalyze activity in this market, but also to start aligning a greater portion of their investment or their endowments with, uh, with the social impact objective. Um, for entrepreneurs, um, the, 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 the activity that we'd like to see more of, and we are seeing a, a huge increase in, is the integration of an impact objective, a social impact objective, into the core of a business model. And that can be done in, uh, through a certification, like the B Corp certification. It can be done by uh, including it in articles of incorporation so that it's, it's more locked in, or by adopting a hybrid corporate form, such as we've seen in, in BC, the, uh, the C3. Um, and then for service providers, typically nonprofits, to have them look at um, opportunities where it's appropriate, and it certainly isn't always, to, uh, to adopt more revenue generation models and to attract capital in order to take what works to scale. And finally, intermediaries. These are the, the sort of honest brokers that can help to bridge the gap between supply and demand in the market and can also help to uh, broker partnerships between these various actors. Because one of the things that, that we're seeing a lot of in this space are new types of partnerships where you've got the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and government all coming together to try to problem solve. And that's not something that we typically have seen a lot of. So that, that's where having some, some actor in the middle that can help bridge those, those gaps can be really important. So finally, just some, some key lessons that, that we've learned from our time acting in this space. Um, public leadership is important, but don't wait for it. So we need, we need governments to, to lead in this space, but there's a lot that can be done uh, and governments tend to move slowly. So getting out ahead of them is, is not a bad idea. <coughs> Philanthropy will continue to have a vital role to play. As I said, this is layering additional capital, additional models on top of those that already exist. There's certainly still a really critical role for philanthropic grant money. Uh, the honest broker, really critical to make those, those bridges appear. Uh, learning from global best practices, but recognizing that all of these models are malleable and should be adapted to local realities. Celebrating early successes and also learning from mistakes. So building in those feedback loops so that we're continuously iterating these models and figuring out what works and revising them as it makes sense for a given population in a given place. Um, and then lastly, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a broader social innovation continuum. So having spaces in which risks can be taken, experimentation is encouraged, um, co-creation with community actors, with the end users of, of a solution is encouraged, um, and where you've got capital that, that can help make these things happen and then take what works to scale. These are all really critical components of this broader innovation space. So just as capital is needed to encourage innovation in uh, traditional business sectors, it's also needed in the social sector, and that's, that's really what this is about. Thanks.